Peter, delighted to have you with us. Thank you very much. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Let me start with the big picture as you see it. So that's the challenges. What do you see as the most important set of challenges facing the world, especially in meeting the, the UN's sustainable development goals and the transition away from carbon energies and, and meeting fundamental human needs? I'm a great believer that this is about mobilizing capital. It's about mobilizing capital, aligning government policy and creating an environment for the change to happen quickly. And I think, to, to my mind, the urgency that's required to make that change happen is it sits with, with people sitting within businesses to, to actually start affecting change. But we've got to build the biggest industry in the history of mankind, and we've got less than 30 years to do it. So getting the capital flowing, getting the innovation happening, to my mind, is an absolute priority. Thank you, Peter. Um, let me, let me follow that through with you, because Schroders are amongst the first asset managers to fully integrate ESG across the entire investment portfolio. You've also been very clear and transparent on which SDGs you can prioritize and you will pursue, and you report along those lines too. So how, how has your institution approached the challenge to date? What are the focus areas and the plans going forward to? Yeah, so so look, I, I think there's a, what we've got to be quite mindful of is there are some tensions as as you as for example as you address climate change and you, and you want to make sure that you do that in the context of good working practices and and, and biodiversity etc. So we we've, we've got to be really mindful that we join up the dots of, of of thinking about the holistic problems that we face rather than being too atomized. But to my mind that, that this starts with. First of all, making sure our own house is in order. So, so to me, that was about setting science-based targets for our own organization, being able to say that where, where we are as a business is clear and, and not, not being ever been in a position where we are capable of being accused of not, not living our own medicine. But our, our opportunity is the fact that we look after a trillion dollars of other people's money. And, and to my mind, how do, how do we help redirect those businesses into areas that, that can affect change on the SDGs that we, we know need it? I mean, your own report said we've got 100 trillion has got to be um, redirected. That's a huge number. So uh, to my mind, we, we've got to basically work through the channels, be it public, public markets, public companies, uh, what needs to what changes need to be affected within each of those businesses getting them to adopt science based targets getting the data holding people's feet to the fire clarifying the action plans that people are taking and then working through that do the same in private markets and i think importantly and i think a really um the next step is how do we direct more investment capital towards nature based solutions and, and, and that's an area that i think has been overlooked because only when we do that can we effectively start to get the price of carbon properly engaged in people's mind and, and the externalities that businesses um, generate properly priced into those, those firms. So to my mind, you know, getting, getting that mindset around carbon and, and, and those externalities will be a big step forward into recognizing that the profits corporates publish are not necessarily the real life representation of what that business has done is the profits minus externalities. And when we start adding in those externalities more appropriately, we will get a much better read on which businesses are good for society and which businesses are taking or producing a lot of externalities. And that, that to my mind, is, is what the role of the asset management industry is, is shining a light into those corners. Peter, interesting. You, you, you've said three very, very important things, at least, that I picked out. The first is, if there's a $100 trillion gap, are you saying that Schroeder's managing a trillion dollars is making a, is making its contribution towards that by managing that trillion dollars very responsibly um, to meet the SDGs and meet the transition requirements? That's, that's part one of my question. Part two is you mentioned nature-based solutions. Um, will you describe a little bit more what you mean by that? And thirdly, you spoke about externalities and um, how, how one prices those in or, or accounts for those. I, I'd like to come back to that one, but the first two. Yeah. So, so first of all, we, 
we look after other people's money and they will set the objectives. But I think we have a moral obligation to, to do two things. One is to help them de determine the right objectives for, for them. So that, that's you know, and, 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 and helping them understand the opportunity of putting a more sustainable objective around those funds. And even when we select companies um, for their portfolios, doing so with an understanding of the risks that those businesses that are not going on the transition are posing for that portfolio and for the for the clients returns in the long term and and even for the businesses that we do select making sure that we hold them to account at every step of the way to make sure this happens quickly and, and i think this point about the exponential nature of the problem is is often mis um misunderrepresent mis, misunderstood insofar as the more we can do now, the better. And, and uh, too often we get caught in sitting in committees and discussing what we should be doing rather than actually seeing cuts today. So that, that's what I mean about how we can run our money. Um, you know, I, I believe that it is our obligation both to help our clients and to help the companies we invest in to make that trillion dollars work as hard as it possibly can. And we, we will find many new opportunities along the way. Wonderful. And nature-based solutions, what does that mean to you? So there are a vast number of projects around the world in, in you know, bl blue carbon, green carbon, um, how we treat soil, how, how we treat river systems that can now be measured effectively um, with low-level satellite imagery, etc. So we can have a proper understanding about nature's natural carbon stores. And, and the Effectively, what you can say to, a, say to a client is that there is an opportunity for you to participate in the carbon credits that you are able to create by investing in those stores of carbon. And to my mind, that is, um, if, if you're running a major pension fund and your, and your corporate sponsor, for example, has made a decision to de-risk that, you know, that maybe they set a science-based target of reducing their carbon by 50% over the next 10 years, but they must make sure they also de-risk and decarbonize their portfolio and investing in nature-based solutions and, and being able to generate those returns will mean we can put a lot more capital to work not just in investing in wind solar and, and, and other technologies that, that will help but also in enhancing the value of the nature that we have and i think there's a big funding gap there today and, and, a, and a big opportunity to apply um, more capital to both areas of the world that could do with it, but also natural assets that could do with it. And, and Peter, does that imply that if you have an investment where they won't do that or can't do that, um, that you would divest from that investment? Absolutely. I think at the end of the day, our, our job is to assess the externalities of a business and, a, a, and you know, now, we're, there are fiduciary obligations that, that many clients are under, but we, we, need, we need to be very clear that pro accounting profit is a pretty poor measure of what a business contributes to broader society. And so, to my mind, our, our role is to have a think about what a business really contributes in aggregate with these their version of profit, but also the cost of the carbon they produce, the cost of the diabetes they produce, the cost of the, the social benefit of the training maybe they give their employees and that holistic view yes. is to my mind real profit and those companies that don't contribute to that need to address why they don't and we need to think about that in the context of the portfolios that we run. Peter in, in pricing that externality do you, are there enough tools out there enough information enough stand enough standardization or do you think we've got a long way to go still? No, Ketan, I think you, you raised possibly one of the most important questions of all, that at the end of the day, this needs to be about data, because the only way we can keep accountability is by having good data. And sadly, the accounting profession is a long way behind. The, the general data that's available from corporates is a long way behind. You know, we need workforce disclosure. We, in, in this, you know, we've, we've got very limited, even carbon disclosure for for scope one and two emissions, never mind scope three emissions. So getting people to adopt things like TCFD, driving that mindset change is going to be really important. And I, I hope that 
we spend as much time thinking about the long-term sustainability of a company in accounting terms as we do about short-term profit accounting. Because to my mind, it's only when we do that can we really start to address this problem and get companies to behave in a manner which is long-term sustainable rather than short-term profitable. And is it profitable to do so as far as you know right now, Peter, to, to take the approach you're taking? Is that, a, is that going to lead to outperformance? Yes. I, I think there's, there is a lot of academic evidence starting to emerge that if you take this view, those companies that you find tend to, uh, and the academic evidence is clear that, that you perform no worse in some studies and in other studies you perform better. And to my mind, that's sort of self-evident, that you're managing risk in understanding the, the stranded assets. And, and you're also thinking about a business's license to operate. And we've seen many examples over time where companies have lost their license to operate and their, their market values have shrunk very considerably. So I, I think all we're doing is holding a mirror to things that people observe on a regular basis and now saying, this has to be part of our transition to addressing those SDGs, because you can you can look at every business against which SDGs it can affect, what it's doing to invest against them, and say, okay, where are we on that transition? And I, that, that, to my mind, makes the portfolio far more interesting. And if I could add one more thing, Kevin, I think we we often think of our wealth management in terms of quite simple things like how much return have I had and how much risk have I had. And if I think about my own personal experience, my and my wife's experience when we sit and think about this, the impact that you've had, the third dimension of what you're doing, not just risk and return, but impact, is far more engaging for people. So being able to articulate that impact and being able to say to people, as a result of doing this, you've taken 30 cars off the road, you've planted 50 trees their emotional engagement with what it is they're doing is far richer. So they stay with it and they are more prepared to invest behind it. And so I do think there's a win-win that will unleash more, more trillions of dollars to solve your problem that you've identified at the beginning, but will also give people a, a better experience and them feeling part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Peter, you've painted a picture of, a, of an institution, of an institution that is holistically thinking about the problem of how we use the world's resources, deploy them, do it profitably. It sounds like a set of values. Is that what you're describing, that Schroeder's under your leadership, and, and of course it's a long-term business, is establishing a series of values around how you do this, backed up by the I, data and the, and the investment thesis and so on? I think, I think I, I haven't thought of it in those terms, but you're, you're absolutely right. The, the, at the end of the day, I mean, Schroeder's been around since 1804, but the, the values that we've put at the core of it have, have stood us in good stead. But, but I think what we're recognising as an industry, and this is much bigger than Schroeder's, is the demand from society is that we cannot cross the road on the other side and say we're just about you know, investing in a business irrespective of how profits are made within that company. And once you once you accept that that is an unacceptable way of operating, then everything else is a, is a natural consequence of that. So I don't, it, values is one way of putting it, but I, I think it's almost common sense. I mean, it's almost, you've got, you cannot walk past on the other side, given the world we're in. And then it's a question of the data to apply it to SDGs, to accelerate change and, and, and getting on with it. And Schroeder's is, is, a, is a global business with global clients. What you've described as a way of doing business, does that translate well across the continents of the world where Schroeder's is present? Do you see, a, do you see a Schroeder's in America embracing the same approach as Europe and Asia and so on? I do. I mean, at, at the end of the day, we're all human beings. We all, we all understand the issue that, yes, that, yes, there are on nuances between regions and, the, and there are legal differences between regions and, and in the US the, you know, the fiduciary obligations are very clear but I do believe that, that most people are clear that the best way of earning good long-term returns is to do so sustainably and I think that by engaging them in that no matter whether they're sitting in Indonesia they're sitting in New York or, or sitting in London 
and, and then giving them the reporting and the tools to help them understand what it is they're doing. And to my mind, that's where we can really help. Because if we if we enable people to understand how they're contributing, then you're appealing to the human emotion as much as the financial emotion. And when you can show people those who are aligned, you can accelerate change much more quickly. That's, that's very interesting to hear, Peter. Also, you know, as, as, as we look at your data, we see that you have a commitment to the SDGs that is very broad. So some of your themes are focused on the environment, some on health um, and wellness, inclusion. Uh, there's a responsible consumption theme and a sustainable infrastructure theme. And at the same time, you focused on net zero and the climate change um, challenges too. How are you thinking about the balance between people and planet? It seems as if what we found was there is an overwhelming commitment to the planetary cause, and that needs to keep increasing, but there's a deficit and financing people-related issues. How do you see that, and how does Schroeder deal with that? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really good problem. I mean, it's a really good question, because I think we, we run the risk of compartmentalizing problems and saying, yes, let's address carbon, and, and then you don't have a just transition, and you end up you know, mm-hmm. lay, laying workers off and actually having more, more of a, 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 an equal and unjust society. So I, I think... We need to be holistic about this. There is no, there is no one SDG which we can say that's that's the holy grail. But that answer that when everything else is solved. So for me, it's about looking at every business, looking at all of their contributions to each of those, and look in the round as to what it is that we can do to affect change in aggregate. Um, you know, I, for me, I think you know, climate without biodiversity, we w- we will get ourselves in a complete mess. Uh, you know, climate without a just society we'll un- unpick all the progress that we've made. So getting that holistic understanding is, is right. And the SDGs provide a very valuable framework for being clear about how it is you're operating. Um, not all of them are easy to invest against, but they all provide a good framework to, to think about where you're affecting change and where you're not. And Peter, are your clients aligned on that? Because there's a lot of uh, attention paid to financial institutions and our report highlights ultimately how much capital, uh, the world's capital, the financial institutions manage. And it's something like nearly 85% of the world's capital ends up in the financial system manager of financial institutions. But two thirds of the world's capital begins with the individual, a third or so with governments. Um, are your clients backers of your approach? Do, do they believe, do you think they care? I think, I, I mean, I, I think it would be wrong of me to give a huge generalization that all our clients care absolutely that wouldn't that's not the case do i think the spectrum is moving strongly to caring more absolutely and you can see that by the very significant flows of money moving into this sector and interestingly do i think there's a group of clients who are prepared to sacrifice return increasingly to affect positive change and wanting impact that's also growing very rapidly i think the challenge the financial system faces is the very heavy levels of disintermediation that exist between a saver who is a client of an insurance company who may pass pass the assets to a third party, who may pass them on to a fund manager, and how do you ensure that what that customer wants, that's three steps removed from the portfolio, is actually getting through and being reported appropriately? And I think the financial disintermediation can, is is going to be a real challenge as we as we recognize that what what individuals want and the financial system is too far from that and we've got to bring the financial system through which is why i say data is so important because if that individual could say as a result of running his portfolio he's doing all this damage or her her portfolio is doing damage i think they may say actually that's not acceptable But unless we give them that data, they won't be able to make those judgments. So it's our job to cut through those layers of of, of different organizations to get the data into the hands of the end individual. Peter, thank you. You've outlined a very exciting picture of what financial services could be as a a whole system that delivers to to the individual and to the planet. Um, Just in the final minute or so as we wrap up, um, is there something you wish would change to allow us to have more chance of achieving the SDG targets 
what you called a just transition and uh, and a better future for for everybody. As I, if only I had a magic wand, I think I, the one the one thing I really wish I could change is that people thought about the whole system. People companies didn't simply dispose of coal assets and hide them in corners or d- sell to private equity bits that they're embarrassed about. I, I would love people to take in and say we have a problem we must solve that problem rather than we'll hide that problem from our shareholders by selling the asset so that we can collectively look at the whole whole of our financial assets around the world and fix the total and i don't think we'll get very far if we sweep the nasty issues under a corner of the carpet and pretend they're not there so that's my wish if i'm allowed one wonderful thank you thank you very much peter i know i know this is short we we could go on for a long time but uh, I really appreciate what you've said and thank you very much. Kevin, I've thoroughly enjoyed it and thank you so much for the great questions.